Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Star. Uh, Lily's not in there right now. And as always, I'd like to remind you to please stay safe and healthy and hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, and hit the notification bell. And today, we're going to get back to Victor Hugo's Les Miserables. We are on Cosette Book 1, Waterloo, and subcategory 9, The Unexpected. There were 3,500 of them. They formed a line half a mile long. They were gigantic men and colossal horses, on colossal horses. There were 26 squadrons, and behind them they had his support, Lefebvre Desnudis Division, the 106 crack gendarmes, the chassers of the guard, 1,197 men, and the lancers of the guard, 880 lancers. They wore helmets without plumes, cuirasses of wrought iron with pistols in their saddle, holsters and long saber swords. That morning they had been the pride of the whole army, when as, at nine o'clock with trumpets blaring and all the bands playing violins, or oh, salute the emperor, empire, they had come up in a dense column, one of their batteries on their flanks, on their flank the other at their center, and deployed in two ranks between the Gen Genap Road and Frischemont, took up their battle position in this powerful second line so wisely set up by Napoleon, which with Kellerman's cuirassiers at its far left, Milhaud's cuirassiers at its far right, and had, so to speak, two wings of iron. The aide de camp, Bernard delivered the emperor's order. Ney drew his sword and placed himself at their head. The enormous squadrons began to move. It was an awesome spectacle. All that cavalry with sabers, drawn banners waving and trumpets, sounding, formed in column by division, charged evenly and as one man with the precision of a bronze battering ram opening a breach down the hill of La Belle Alliance sank into that awesome trough where so many, so many men had already fallen, disappeared in the smoke, then rising from this valley of Shadows re reappeared on the other side, still compact and close, riding at f a full trot through a hail of grape shot, bursting against them up the frightful mud slope of the Mont St. John Plateau. They rose, grave, menacing, imperturbable, in, yeah, that's what it says, in the intervals between the musketry and artillery. The colossal sound of the hoofbeats could be heard. Being in two divisions, they formed two columns. With you as the vision had the right, the lords the left, from a distance they could be taken, for two immense steel serpents stretching toward the crest of the plateau. They coursed through the battle like a miracle. Nothing like it had been seen since the taking of the great redoubt at La Moscova by the heavy cavalry. Marat was not there, but Ney was. It seemed as if this mass had become a monster with a single mind. Each squadron undulated and swelled like the quills of uh, <coughs> Paulo. They could be seen through occasional breaks in the slick smoke. It was a jumble of helmets, cries, sabers, a furious bounding of horses, rumps among the cannon fire, and flourishing trumpets, a terrible and dis disciplined tumult over everything, the armored breastplates like the scales of a hydra. Their, these accounts seemed to belong to another age. Something like this vision undoubtedly appeared in the old Orphic epics, tell, epics telling of centaurs, these, those titans with human faces and the bodies of horses who scaled Olympus at a gallop. Horrible, invulnerable, sublime at once, gods and beasts. In odd numerical coincidence, 26 battalions were waiting for these 26 squadrons behind the crest of the plateau under cover of the masked battery. The English infantry formed in 13 squares. Two battalions in the square and in two lines, seven on the first and six on the second, with muskets raised and trained, waiting calm, silent, immovable. They could not see the cuirassiers, and the cuirassiers could not see them. They listened to the rising of this tide of men. They heard the growing sound of 3,000 horses, the alternating measured strike of their hoofs at a full trot, the rattling of arm, armor, the clicking of sabers, and a sort of ferocious 
roar of the advancing horde. There was a moment of fearful silence, then suddenly a long line of raised arms, brandishing sabers, appeared above the crest, and the helmets and the trumpets and the banners, and three thousand faces with gray mustaches crying, Viva la Emperor! All well, this cavalry emerged into the plat onto the plateau, and it was like the start of an earthquake, all at once and tragically, at the English left, and on our right, the head of the cuirassiers' column reared with a frightening din, reaching the culminating point of the crest, going at full tel tilt, full of fury, and bent on the extermination of the squares and cannons. The cuirassiers saw between themselves and the English a ditch, a grave. It was the sunken road to Ohaim. It was a moment of terror. There was the ravine, unexpected, gaping right at the horse's feet, twelve feet deep between its banks. The second rank pushed in the first, the third pushed in the second. The horses reared, lurched backward, fell under their rumps, and struggled, writhing with their feet in the air, piling up and throwing their riders. No means to retreat. The whole column was nothing but a projectile. The momentum to crush the English crushed the French. The inexorable ravine could not yield until it was filled. Riders and horses rolled in together, held the skelter, grinding against each other, making common flesh in this dreadful gulf. And when this grave was full of living men, the rest marched above them, over them, excuse me, and went on. Almost a third of Dubois, or Dubois' brigade sank into the abyss. <coughs> Here began the loss of the battle. A local tradition clearly exaggerated says that 2,000 horses and different hundred and 1,500 men were buried in the sunken road of Ohain. This undoubtedly includes all the other bodies thrown into the ravine on the day after the battle. We would note in passing that it was the Du Bois Brigade so mort mortally tried, which an hour earlier in attacking alone had carried out the colors of Lunaborg Battalion. Before ordering the discharge of Milhaud's cuirassiers, Napoleon had examined the ground, but could not see the sunken road, which did not show even a dip on the surface of the plateau. Warned, however, and put on his guard by the little white chapel that marks its junction with the Nivelles Road, and probably on the likelihood of some obstacles, he had put a question to the guide, Lacoste. The guy had, guy didn't know, had answered no. It may almost be said that from this shake of a peasant's head came Napoleon's downfall. Other strokes of fate were still to come. Might it have been impossible for Napoleon to win this battle? We answer, no. Why? Because of Wellington. Because of Blucher. No, because of God. For Bonaparte to be conqueror at Waterloo was no longer within the law of the 19th century. Another series of acts was underway in which Napoleon had no place. The ill will of events had long been coming. It was time for this titan to fall. The excessive weight of this man and human destiny disturbed the equilibrium. This individual alone counted for more than the whole of mankind. This plethora of all human vitality concentrated within a single head. The world rising to the brain of one man would be fatal to civilization if it endured. The moment had come for incorruptible supreme equality to look into it. Probably the principles and elements on which regular gravitation and the moral and material orders the pen that had begun to mute, mutter, reeking blood, overcrowded cemeteries, weeping mothers. These are formidable plaintiffs. When the earth is suffering from a su surcharge, there are mysterious moanings from the deeps that the heavens hear. Napoleon had been p impeached before the infinite, and his fall was decreed. He annoyed God. And I know some other people that annoy God, too. For Waterloo is not a battle. It is the changing face of the universe. Subcategory 10. The Plateau of mont saint jean, -Jean. At the same time as the incident of the ravine, the artillery came out of hiding. Sixty cannon and the thirteen squares thundered and flashed at the cuirassiers. Point blank, the brave general of the Lord gave the military, military salute to the English battery. At a gallop of the English light artillery took, took took up position within their formations. The cuirassiers did not even have time to catch a breath. The disaster of the sunken road had dis decimated, but not discouraged them. These men were diminished in number, grew stronger in spirit, 
Wathier's column alone had suffered a disaster. The lords, which Ney had sent off obliquely to the left, as if he had some foreboding of the trap, arrived unscathed. The cuirassiers hurled themselves at the English formations. At a full gallop, with free rein, sabers between the teeth and pistols in hand, the attack began. There are moments in battle when the soul hardens a man to the point of changing the soldier into a statue, all flesh turning to granite. The English battalions, desperately assailed, did not yield an inch. So it was appalling. The English formations were attacked on all the sides, on all sides of one at once. A frenzied whirlwind enveloped them. The cool-headed infantry remained impassable. The first rank, with knee to the ground, received the cuirassiers on their bayonets. The second shot, second shot them down. Behind the sec, behind the second rank, the cannoneers loaded their guns. The front of the square opened, made way for a blast of grape shot, and closed again. The cuirassiers answered by crushing them. The huge horses reared, trampled on the ranks, leaped over the, leapt over the bayonets, and fell gigantic, in the midst of the four living walls. The bullets made gaps in the ranks of the cuirassiers. The cuirassiers made breaches in the squares. Files of men disappeared, ground beneath the horses' feet. Bayonets were buried in the bellies of these centaurs, hence a gruesome display of wounds, never, perhaps, seen elsewhere. The formations eroded by this raging cavalry closed up without wavering, inexhaustible and grape shot. They kept on firing in the midst of their attackers. It was a monstrous sight. These formations were no longer battalions. They were craters. The cuirassiers were no longer cavalry. They were a tempest. Each formation was a volcano at each formation was a volcano attacked by a thundercloud, lava fought with lightning. The formation to the extreme right, the most exposed of all being an open field, was almost annihilated in the first wave. It was made up of the 75th Regiment of Highlanders. The piper in the center, while the work of extermination was going on, profoundly oblivious to all around him, lowering his melancholy eye, filled with the reflections of forests and lakes. Seated on a drum, his bagpipe under his arm, was playing his high land airs. These Scots died thinking of Ben Lothian, or Ben, this is Lothian. As the Greeks died, remember in Argos, the saber of a cuirassier striking down the pillbrock, and the arm that played it stopped the song by killing the player. The cuirassiers, relatively few in number, diminished by the catastrophe of the ravine, had to contend with almost the entire English army, but they multiplied in effectiveness, each man becoming the equal of ten. Nonetheless, some Hanoverian battalions fell back. Wellington saw it <clears throat> and remembered his cavalry. Had Napoleon at that very moment remembered his infantry, he would have won the battle. This oversight was his great fatal blunder. What happens when you forget your people? Suddenly the assailing cuirassiers fell, felt assailed. The English cavalry was, without, was at their backs. Before them, the formations behind them, Somerset, Somerset with 1,400 dragoon guards, Somerset had on his right, Dornberg with his German light horse, and on his left trip with the Belgian car carabiners, the cuirassiers attacked front, flank, and rear by infantry, and cavalry were compelled to face in all directions. What was that to them? They were a whirlwind, whirlwind. Their valor surpassed words. Besides, behind them, they had the ever-thundering artillery. All of that was necessary in order to wound each other, each to wound such men in the back. One of their cuirasses, with a hole in the left shoulder, played from a musket ball, is in the collection of the Waterloo Museum. For such Frenchmen, it took no less than the likes of these Englishmen. It was no longer a conflict. It was a darkness a fury, a giddy vortex of souls and courage, a hurricane of flashing swords. In an instant, the 1,400 horse guards were only 800 fuller. Their lieutenant colonel fell, fell dead. Ney rushed up, rushed up with the lancers and the favored de Sonnet's chassers. The plateau of mont saint Jean was taken, retaken, taken again. The cuirassiers left the cavalry return to the infantry, or more precisely, all this terrible multitude. 
wrestled with each other without letting go. The square still had held. They were held. They were. There were twelve assaults. Four horses were killed on the day. Half the cuirassiers lay on the plateau. Their struggle lasted two hours. The English army was terribly shaken. There is no doubt that if they had not been crippled in their first blow by the disaster of the sunken road, the cuirassiers would have overwhelmed the center and secured the victory. This extraordinary cavalry astounded Clinton, who held who had seen Tal Talavera and Badjo's Wellington, the three-fourths con conquered, were struck with heroic admiration. He said half aloud, splendid. The cuirassiers annihilated seven squares out of thirteen, took her spite sixty pieces of artillery, and took from the English six regimental colors, which three cura cuirassiers and three chassers of the guard carried to the emperor at the farm of La Belle Alliance. Wellington's situation was growing worse. The strange battle was like a duel between two wounded zealots, who, while still fighting and resisting, lose all their blood, which of the two would, two would be first to fall. The struggle <coughs> of the plateau continued. How far did the cuirassiers penetrate? No one can say. One thing is certain. The day after the battle, a cuirassier and his horse was found dead under the frame of the hay scales <coughs> in Mont St. John, at the point where the four roads from Nivelles, Genap, La Hulpe, and Brussels meet. This horseman had pierced the English lines. One of the men who took away the body still lives at Mont St. John. His name is Del De Hayes. He was then 18 years old. Wellington felt that he was giving away. The crisis was quickly approaching. The cuirassiers had not succeeded in the sense that the center was not broken. With everyone holding the plateau, nobody held it. With everyone holding the plateau, nobody held it. And in fact, it remained for the most part with the English. Wellington held the village in the crowning plain. Ney held only the crest and the slope. Both sides seemed rooted to this funeral, funeral so soil. But the weakening, weakening of the English appeared. It, Irremediable. That's what said. The hemorrhage of their army was horrible. Kemp on the left, on the left flank, called for reinforcements. There are none," answered Wellington. "Let him die." At almost the same, almost at the same moment, singular coincidence that indicates the exhaustion of both armies. Ney sent a Napoleon for infantry, and Napoleon exclaimed, "Infantry? Where does he think I could get them? Does he expect me to make them?" However, the English army was farthest gone. Furious onslaughts of these great squadrons with iron cuirasses and steel breastplates had ground up the infantry. A few men around a flag, around a flag marked a regiment. Battalions were now commanded by captains or lieutenants. Allen's division, already so badly cut up at La Haye Saint, was almost destroyed. The intrepid Belgians of Van Cluses, of Van Cluses brigade, was strewn on the rye field along the Novellas Road. There was hardly anything left of those Dutch grenadiers who in 1811, among our ranks in Spain, fought against Wellington, and who in 1815 rallied to the English side, fought against Napoleon. The loss in officers was heavy. Lord Uxbridge, whose leg was buried the next day, had a, fra <coughs> had a fractured name. If on, if on the French side in the struggle of the cuirassiers, the Lord Lertier... Colbert, Colbert, Knopp, Travers, and Blankard were disabled on the English side. Al Alton was wounded. Barn was wounded. Delancey was killed. Van Merlin was killed. Uh, Tita was killed. Wellington's entire staff was decimated. And England had the worst share in this balance of blood. The second regiment of foot guards had lost five lieutenant colonels, four captains, and three lieutenants. The first battalion of the 13th 30, 30th Infantry had lost 24 officers and 112 soldiers. The 79th Highlanders had 24 officers wounded, 18 officers killed, and 450 soldiers slain. Cumberland's Hanoverian Hussars, an entire regiment under Colonel Hack, who was afterward court-martialed and broken, had turned in the face of flight and were fleeing through the forest of Soines, spreading Panic as far as Brussels. Carts, ammunition, wagons, baggage, wagons, 
wagons, baggage wagons, wagons full of wounded, seeing the French gain ground and approach the forest, it fled. <clears throat> the Dutch, kept cut down by the French cavalry, cried for help from Bert Cucot to <coughs> Ronendel over a distance of nearly six miles going toward Brussels. The roads, the roads, according to the testimony of witnesses, still living, were choked with fugitives. This panic was such that it reached the Prince of Conde at Malines and Louis the Eighteenth at Ghent, with the exception of the small reserve drawn up in Echelon, Echelon behind the field hospital set up at the farm of Mont Saint John, and the brigades of Vivian and Vandelier flanking to the, the left wing. Wellington's cavalry was exhausted. Numerous artillery units lay dismounted. These facts are acknowledged by Siborn and Pringle. Exaggerating the disaster even says that the Anglo-Dutch army was reduced to 34,000 men. The Iron Duke remained calm, but his lips were pale. The Austrian commissioner, Vincent, the Spanish commissioner, Al Alava, present at the battle on the English staff, considered the Duke lost. Five o'clock, Wellington drew out his watch and was heard to murmur these somber words. Blucher or darkness. It was about this time that a distant line of bayonets glistened on the heights behind beyond Frischemont. Here's the turning point in this colossal drama. Subcategory 11. Bad guide for Napoleon. Good for Bulow. We know Napoleon's bitter mistake. Grouchy an anticipated. Blucher's arrival, death instead of life. Destiny at such turnings. He was expecting the throne of the world, but St. Helena rose into view instead. As the little shepherd was, who acted as a guide to Bulow, Blucher's lieutenant had advised him to leave the forest above Frischemont rather than below Planchenoid. Planchenoid. The shape of the 19th century would perhaps have been different. Napoleon would have won the Battle of Waterloo by any other approach than below Planchenoid. The Prussian army would have wound up at a ravine impassable to artillery, and Bulow would not have arrived. Now an hour of delay, as the Prussian general muffling declares, and Blucher would not have found Wellington in position, the battle was lost. It was high time, as we see, for Bulow to arrive. He was actually very late. He had bivouacked at dion le Mont and started out at dawn, but the roads were impassable, and his divisions were mired down. The cannon sank to the hubs in the ruts. Furthermore, he had to cross the dial on the narrow Waver Road bridge. The, br the road leading to the bridge had been set on fire by the French. The caissons and artillery wagons, being unable to pass between two rows of burning houses, had to wait till the fire was extinguished. extinguished. It was noon before Bulow was able to reach Chapelle St. Lambert. Had the action begun two hours earlier, it would have been finished at four o'clock, and Blucher would have come upon us, field won by Napoleon. Such are the immense chances in proportion to an infinity that escapes us. As early as noon, the Emperor, first of all, with his field glass, saw on the, fore, on the far horizon something that caught his attention. He had said, Over oh, there I see a cloud that looks to me like troops. Then he asked the Duke of Dalmatia, Sulp, what do you see toward Chapelle St. Lambert? The marshal turned his field glasses that way, answered, Four or five thousand men, sire, grouchy, of course. However, it remained motionless in the haze. The field glasses of the whole staff studied it, studied the cloud, pointed out by the emperor. Some said they are columns halting. Most said it, it is trees. The fact is that the cloud was not moving. The emperor detached Doman's division of light cavalry to reconnoiter this obscure point. Bulow, in fact, had not moved. His vanguard was very weak and could do nothing. He had to wait for the bulk of his corps, and he was ordered to concentrate his force before entering the line. But at five o'clock, seeing Wellington was in danger, Bluka ordered Bulow to attack. With these remarkable words, we must give the English army a breathing spell. Soon after, with the divisions of Lawston, Hiller, Hack, and Rysel, deployed in front of Lobau's corps, the cavalry of Prince William of Prussia came out of the Paris woods. Plansonoid was in flames, and the Prussian bullets began to rain down 
even onto the ranks of the guard and reserve behind Napoleon. Uh, subcategory 12, the guard. The rest is known. The attack of a third army, the battle disrupted 86 pieces of artillery suddenly belching fire, perched the first coming up with Bulo, Zethin's cavalry, cavalry led by Beluger in person, the French driven back, Mark Cognet swept off the plateau of Ohain, De Rutt dislodged from Papalot, Donzelot in quiet, retreating, Lobaud taking an, an, at an angle, a new battle at nightfall hurled at our dismantled regiments, the whole English line assuming the offensive, and pushed forward the gigantic gap made in the French army, the English and the Prussian grape shot, leading, lending mutual aid, extermination, disaster in front, and disaster on the flank, the guard entering the line amid this terrible collapse. Feeling they were ver they were going to their death, they cried out, Viva la Emperor! There is nothing more poignant in history than the death agony bursting out in acclamations. The sky had been overcast all day. All at once, at that very moment, it was eight o'clock in the evening. The clouds in the horizon parted, and through the elms on the Nivellas road streamed the sinister red light of the setting sun. The rising sun had been seen at Austerlitz. For this final effort, each battalion of the guard was commanded by a general, Friant, Michael, Michael, or Michael, Roget, Harlot, Mallet, Paray de Morat, Moravan were there, when the tall helmets of the grenadiers of the guard, with their large eagle plaques, appeared, symmetrical, drawn up in line, calm. In the haze of their, that conflict, the enemy felt respect for France. They seemed to see twenty victories coming onto the battlefield with wings extended, and those who were conquerors, thinking themselves conquered, recoiled, thinking themselves conquered, recoiled. But Wellington cried, up guards and aim straight. The red, the red regiment of English guards, lying behind the hedges, rose up a hail of grape shot, riddled the tricolored flag, fluttering around our eagles. Everything was hurled forward, and the final carnage began. In the length, lengthening shadows, the Imperial Guard felt the army giving way around them, and the vast sh shudder of the step rout they heard, every man for himself, which had replaced the Viva la Emperor, with flight behind them, they held to their course, battered harder and harder, and dying more at every step. There was, there were no weak souls or cowards there. The privates of that band were as heroic as their generals. Not a man flinched from the suicide. Nay, desperate, gr great, in all the gr grandeur of accepting death, bared himself to every blow in this tempest. His fifth horse was killed under him, streaming with sweat fire in his eyes, froth on his lips, his uniform unbuttoned, one of his paulets half cut away by the saber strokes of a horse guard, his great eagle badge dented by a ball, bloody covered with mud, magnificent, a broken sword in his hand. He said, come and see how a marshal of France dies on the battlefield. But in vain he did not die. He was haggard and indignant. He flung his, this question at Druid de Erlon, what, aren't you going to die? He cried out in the midst of this artillery, of all this artillery, crushing a handful of men. What, nothing for me? How I wished all these English bullets were buried in my body. Unfortunate man, you were reserved for French bullets. And I am going to stop right there. And in the next video, get back to subcategory 13 of um, Victor Hugo's Les Miserables Waterloo. Cosette. But if you enjoyed this video, please hit like, subscribe, comment below, and hit that notification bell. And also, stay safe and healthy, and stay tuned for the next video, and have a great day.